there's a, a wider diverse group of people here and um, I'm really happy to be here talking to uh, rank and file health and safety representatives. Uh, I do have uh, a particular uh, fondness for health and safety reps having done the role, um, albeit uh, many decades ago. Uh, so I do have uh, some, uh, of some experience and some knowledge about the difficulties of being safety reps or being a safety rep. Um, so uh, you know, the, idea, uh, the option of coming here today or the invite to come here today uh, was something that I was particularly keen to do. We have to work out a signal here and we're working good so far. So typically uh, I, I put up this slide which identifies the numbers of fatalities and incidents that have occurred uh, amongst Australia, uh, a comparative table looking at the national picture. Um, but I'm, I'm going to divert uh, away from that. Um, and as Owen has uh, indicated, uh, the past couple of weeks have been particularly uh, troubling because of the number of uh, fatalities that have occurred uh, in a couple of industries. So for 21-22, we are now up to uh, the highest number of fatalities uh, for some years. So I have to go back to uh, 2014 to identify uh, a year where we had uh, worst figures. Uh, that's uh, particularly troubling. Um, and of course, uh, as Owen has indicated, the agricultural industry seems to be a predominant um, industry that's, uh, that's having a number of those incidents. So. Uh, it is a constant reminder of uh, the importance of uh, work health and safety. Um, the, the, the slide identifies the number of uh, uh, workers that have lost their lives uh, over the past years. Uh, what it doesn't uh, show is the number of workers that have lost their lives in non-traumatic uh, instances. So uh, many of you will be familiar or have had some involvement uh, in, in relation to some hazardous chemicals like asbestos. and. Uh, 4,000 workers a year uh, die as a result of being exposed to asbestos and a lot of discussion in, in recent years around uh, the recent phenomenon with, uh, with house, uh, housing refurbishments and uh, uh, the fad with uh, the shows on TV which is uh, generating another spate of exposures. So uh, workers have uh, experienced a lot of harm uh, just to go to work and that's, uh, that's something that, uh, that drives my thinking uh, and something that I think is important to remind us as to what we're here for and, and what we need to try and describe to change. Thank you. So I thought I'd start with the statement of regulatory intent. Um, so obviously with the introduction of the new laws, uh, I wanted to provide some guidance to the industry to understand how we would approach uh, the role as a regulator uh, in applying the new laws, noting that uh, a number of the provisions in the legislation and the regulations are similar to the previous uh, arrangements, but there is a substantial amount of change uh, with the new laws. Uh, and so uh, part of the change incorporates uh, a whole lot of transitional provisions. So um, uh, it's intended to give industry uh, a period of time to get up to speed with the new requirements, uh, whether it's there's things like uh, new licensing regimes or new licensing requirements. Uh, years uh, for the training industry to put together the courses, deliver the training and, uh, and allow industry to, uh, to meet the new requirements. Statement of regulatory intent uh, is a, a fairly basic and fundamental document but an important one. So I, I did want to ensure that industry understa understood how we would approach it. Uh, ideally uh, I wanted our inspectors to be providing uh, information education to all parts of industry to understand the new requirements. So it's really important that um, uh, we provide information to industry. Uh, our, our legislation is a self-regulatory model, uh, which means that we need PCBU's employers uh, to work with their workers and provide a safe workplace. Uh, to do that, we have to provide information and education. So it's a, it's a cornerstone of our uh, legislative framework. Uh, but in the regulatory intent, it does preserve the right to recognise uh, that some workplaces aren't interested in providing safe workplaces or perhaps uh, worse than that, um, actively uh, avoid doing those things. So in those circumstances there is discretion for our inspectors uh, to use the enforcement powers that are contained in the legislation. So uh, I think that is uh, appropriate and reasonable um, and it, it has worked uh, um, from the reports that I've received uh, reasonably, reasonably well. It is uh, a model for regulators, it's not necessarily new, um, but we, I thought it was a good, uh, a good way of explaining uh, what it is that, that we need to do as a safety regulator. 
um, and uh, it's been in place uh, now um, for several months with the intention to uh, cease one year after the commencement of the legislation. Uh, there's been a lot of feedback and I'm uh, welcome feedback from uh, Unions WA uh, about the potential rolling on of the intent uh, and perhaps looking at um, identifying some key priority areas and, and focus for particular industries. Um, I'm going to talk through uh, a couple of key priority areas and, uh, and a, couple of the, a couple of those that, uh, that um, Owen has, has touched on. Uh, but I thought I'd start just with the, in terms of the one work safe. So as far as the work out the safety legislation is concerned, uh, it has brought together a, a number of industries uh, that have operated under separate instru instruments with different statutory office positions. Uh, so what we have now is one regulator overseeing all industries. So that obviously covers the general industries as well as petroleum and mining. Uh, and so all of the parts of, uh, uh, of WorkSafe are brought together from those uh, respective industries. So uh, I think that's a substantial uh, improvement to our legislative framework uh, in Western Australia. It means that uh, we can start to drive consistency in terms of the application of uh, regulatory activities um, and uh, that will uh, hopefully uh, improve the safety performance of, uh, of all of the industries that we regulate. Uh, there is a caveat, of course. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you have had uh, involvement or dealings in the federal jurisdiction, uh, and there are other regulators um, such as Comcare, AMSA, uh, not SEMA, of course, uh, um, ONSA, the, I'm throwing out a whole lot of acronyms, the, so the, the, the rail uh, safety regulator. So there's a number of other regulators that regulate uh, parts of industry, um, uh, and of course, uh, we we uh, work safe, work closely uh, with those other regulatory agencies. So uh, whilst we have one regulator covering off on general uh, mines and petroleum, uh, there are some other uh, aspects of work that uh, are not covered by us. Someone owes a drink. Psychosocial <laughs> <laughs> uh, hazards, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, uh, Sally, as a specialist uh, director in this space, uh, will talk a little bit about it. Um, I've put an extract uh, up there. Um, uh, th that extract is from one of the codes of practice. Uh, and it is something that is front of my mind, not just as a regulator, but also as a, a leader within an organisation with responsibility for other workers. So uh, it's, it's uh, the, the codes of practice that we've produced that cover off on psychosocial risks, workplace behaviours, um, occupational violence, uh, talk about uh, leadership and uh, anybody that has been in safety for a while understands that uh, where there is strong commitment from leaders, uh, invariably that has a, a positive outcome at the workplace. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, I have a couple of roles in this space, obviously to uh, advocate for compliance uh, for all of industry, but also to be a leader within the organisation uh, that I run as well. So something that uh, I think is particularly important is always to uh, be respectful to uh, the people that you're dealing with. Uh, we do deal in some really complex um, and sensitive uh, matters and uh, it does get trying, um, but uh, I think there is always an uh, opportunity to be respectful and courteous. Uh, I, I do also have a, a background uh, in construction, so I don't mind a, a bit of rough and tumble, and uh, my mate Bob at the back loves to throw barbs at me from time to time, so I do have to defend myself, but uh, it's all uh, very uh, pleasant stuff. Uh, as far as psychosocial hazards is concerned, I mentioned a couple of the codes of practice. Uh, Western Australia produced those codes of practice um, in advance of just about every other state and territory, uh, and I might say that uh, uh, your uh, Unions WA Secretary has had a large role to play in the development of that. Um, uh, so those codes are instructive for uh, all industries to understand how to effectively manage psychosocial risks, uh, how to uh, manage workplace behaviours, deal with things like uh, sexual harassment uh, and bullying behaviours. Um, and, and so from a Western Australian perspective, I'm, I'm uh, very pleased that we have been able to put out that documentation. Of course, in the mining sector, there is the FIFO code of practice. Uh, so that was put out a number of years ago, and that was uh, that, that also led uh, the country uh, with respect to that guidance. Uh, that particular code is under some revision, but uh, we do now have a large body of information available uh, for industry to understand how to manage uh, these risks. Uh, and I might say that we, a lot of the, our focus and attention from a regulating perspective is to, to look at the um, serious traumatic incidents that result in fatalities. 
Uh, but it's not lost on, on myself and a number of my colleagues that the health side of health and safety uh, often doesn't attract the attention. Uh, I mentioned the effects of exposure to things like hazardous chemicals and asbestos uh, and having the, the, the dramatic uh, impact on workers uh, through those exposures. With psychosocial hazards, it does cause harm. Uh, it does cause uh, serious harm to some people. Um, and so it is important that uh, all workplaces uh, place uh, an, a priority on this particular area. Um, only a couple of years ago we were talking about mental health and I, uh, I think I was here at a conference uh, with some other delegates talking about mental health uh, and the importance of having a code of practice and we've, we've done that since then. Uh, but there is a long way to go in terms of being able to manage this. So whilst we've produced the guidance, we've now articulated uh, what the hazard looks like, what the causes of that are, uh, and importantly, how to uh, effectively manage it. Uh, that is still new to a lot of workplaces. Uh, there is training required for people that are in charge of other people to understand how to have uh, professional, productive, uh, and positive conversations with people. Uh, so it's not easy in some industries that uh, operate in high-risk, high-tempo type environments. Um, but uh, it is important and so uh, I have uh, spent quite a bit of time making sure that uh, in all of my addresses that uh, psychosocial hazards are uh, emphasised. Um, a lot of uh, discussion in relation to the Enough is Enough report after the mining inquiry into sexual harassment in the mining industry. Uh, I've put a, a quote up there. Um, uh, there's a, a, a leader in the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, that drafted the Respect at Work report. Uh, that extract is, is from her and uh, from my perspective it's something uh, I uh, keep reminding uh, all industries. So the mining industry uh, has been on display and highlighted a whole lot of uh, abhorrent behaviours in that sector. Um, the inquiry has uh, enabled uh, affected people to come forward and tell their stories um, and to make recommendations to government to start to turn around uh, that particular industry. But from my perspective, uh, the vantage point uh, that I have, this is not just a single industry problem. So uh, Kate Jenkins has articulated far better than I can, uh, wrote a comprehensive report which is the blueprint or the model uh, that we should be using to try and fix this um, societal cultural problem. Um, of course we've got to deal with uh, the, the mining industry and the things that have been identified through the Enough is Enough report uh, and there is a com comprehensive response from government which we're working through. Uh, but when I talk to uh, people from other industries, uh, particularly male dominated industries, uh, I do point to the Enough is Enough report and uh, make the point that uh, they shouldn't be thinking that it is just a matter for the mining industry. Uh, they should be using the recommendations in the report uh, from that inquiry as a basis for starting to change uh, the, the cultural attitudes uh, that exist in, uh, in other industries and starting to make the change. So let's not wait around. Um, uh, let's start working on fixing issues across uh, all particular industries. <coughs> a lot of uh, discussion around the agricultural industry um, over the past few weeks uh, and sadly uh, for uh, uh, the, the reason that Owen uh, indicated earlier that we've had a number of uh, fatalities. Um, I, I have uh, reflected and been involved in safety for a, a period of time and uh, the mining industry and the construction industry had some similar circumstances occurring uh, 15 plus years ago where there was a spate of uh, incidents and fatalities and that prompted uh, a substantial change uh, in those industries. Um, it didn't take uh, five minutes, it took a lot of years to change the way in which those particular industries dealt uh, with safety and particularly uh, providing protection for workers. Uh, but it doesn't appear to me that that same cultural shift is occurring in the agricultural industry uh, and looking back and doing that comparative analysis against those other industries and that's troubling. Uh, there is commentary from parts of that industry uh, that uh, seek to deflect and point to other people uh, to try and uh, deal with this problem, um, pick holes in arguments about statistics and uh, uh, those sorts of things and, and whilst we have those sorts of attitudes uh, that will continue to be a problem 
Uh, from my perspective, the, uh, there's a couple of things that I think are really important. WHS legislation has given us the opportunity to conduct this inquiry. So this particular inquiry has been able to be called because of uh, the new powers in the WHS legislation. Uh, that is a, a substantial benefit to uh, Western Australia. From my perspective, we didn't need to wait for a parliamentary inquiry to look into uh, the circumstances of the agricultural deaths. Uh, so that's a substantial uh, positive. Um, uh, we've got an independent inquiry now that is looking at the statistics, is looking at the culture, uh, looking at the trends associated with a number of the fatalities. The most recent uh, report uh, involving a quad bike, uh, almost 25% of uh, all the deaths in the agricultural industry are as a result of quad bikes. And we still see representatives from the industry that advocate uh, for the use of, of, of quad bikes. In actual fact, when the, uh, I think it's the ACCC, uh, introduced some national laws to mandate seat belts and rollover cages and uh, some other safety devices. Uh, I heard that uh, parts of the industry were actively going out to get um, uh, quad bikes that were on sale because of uh, the fact they didn't want the new safety devices. So look, there's a whole lot of issues in terms of the agricultural inquiry. It's, it's incredibly sad that we do continue to see uh, the number of people that die in the agricultural industry. Uh, I'm convinced that we are uh, delving into this um, and uh, we'll come up with a, a roadmap to, to, to start to turn it around. Uh, there's lots of conversation going on in the community, um, and so not just on the agricultural inquiry. Uh, my observation uh, in, in terms of the discussion that has been generated as a result of the WHS Act uh, and the regulations, as well as the communication about these incidents is that health and safety is being discussed a lot more than it has been in, in the past. And um, again, just reflecting back over previous years, uh, I remember when uh, the Think Safe Sam uh, campaign was on and there was some football, I can't, I can't remember who the football was, he's, he's pretty terrible, but uh, he, was, um, uh, he was promoting uh, work health and safety. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion back then, obviously we had the new uh, regulations that were brought in uh, in the mid uh, 90s, uh, and so there was some discussion going on uh, around uh, occupational safety and health uh, back then. Uh, now we are seeing um, discussions uh, in the public, uh, discussions in the media, uh, and a lot of activity uh, through your representative organisations as well as others. So, so that is a good thing. Um, we need to keep uh, keep that momentum going, um, and importantly for the agricultural industry, uh, try and stop the number of deaths. Uh, Owen did talk about silica, and fortunately I was at the back of the room, so I didn't hear everything that he said. Um, uh, from a WA perspective, uh, we conducted a, a proactive campaign and uh, I do see that Western Australia is different to the rest of the country on this, on this particular topic. Uh, it is a, a problem, um, so not to counter uh, Owen's uh, points earlier, uh, silica has been a known hazard for a long period of time. Um, from a Western Australian perspective, uh, we haven't seen uh, the volume of uh, apartment uh, building that uh, Queensland and New South Wales has. Um, and uh, the proactive project that we did um, uh, finishing in uh, May 2021 uh, identified a whole lot of issues. Uh, there was uh, hundreds of uh, workplace inspections, uh, over a thousand uh, enforcement measures taken uh, with that particular sector of the industry. Um, that's not to suggest for a moment that uh, we're able to fix all of those problems, but uh, from a regulating perspective, uh, we were out there uh, conducting those um, activities. Uh, we also produced a whole lot of guidance, so there's on the, uh, our websites is uh, uh, stone uh, uh, benchtop checklists and, uh, and other guidance material and material produced in other languages is really important uh, because um, uh, there are people with non-English speaking backgrounds that work in that industry. And so we wanted to make sure that that information uh, was able to be understood for uh, workers that uh, might come from other, uh, other backgrounds. Um, there's still a lot of discussion to be had around silica. Um, I was an advocate of, the, uh, of lowering the exposure standard uh, to the lowest possible threshold, so that debate is still uh, something that needs to be had into the future. Uh, the National Dust Disease Task Force talked about some other conditions like licensing. Uh, from my perspective, the, the problem with licensing is it shifts the problem to some years down the road and uh, I, I don't particularly like uh, that concept. Um, and in terms of looking at uh, the, the, the product itself, 
uh, there is a discussion to be had about the, the continued use of a product that contains 90 plus percent uh, silica. So even with effective controls, uh, there is a, a high risk that workers will continue to be exposed uh, to that, and, and we know that uh, exposure is a, to, um, can lead to debilitating uh, illness. Uh, Owen did touch on a couple of key things that West Australia has done, uh, which is not just uh, a nationally leading um, uh, initiative, but a, a world leading initiative. Uh, the, the fantastic thing that we do have in Western Australia is having expert physicians uh, within our, um, uh, uh, within our uh, the business. Uh, so they are able to look at uh, data uh, as, from a specialist perspective and try to identify where there are issues. Uh, the adoption of the um, low dose CT for health monitoring, uh, as I say, is uh, uh, world leading. Uh, and is already starting to, to show some uh, positive benefits. So, uh, so lots of positive things uh, from a Western Australian perspective, but still a long way to go. Uh, when you look at other naturally occurring products which have lower concentrations in silica, but still uh, have reasonable concentrations, um, uh, there's still some work to do there. So construction and mining industry, uh, quarrying industry, uh, they have uh, levels of silica in those that uh, we need to make sure uh, are pro being properly managed. Really there. Um, uh, so uh, I won't go on to uh, go on too much here, uh, other than to say that the new provisions in the WHS Act do provide uh, additional support for uh, health and safety representatives, um, uh, including the ability to uh, direct uh, work to stop. So um, the government has adopted um, really important provisions uh, for use by health and safety representatives. Uh, Health and safety reps are integral to our, uh, to our safety framework. Um, there has been a reduction in the numbers of health and safety reps uh, over, uh, over a number of years, and I don't think uh, I would be the first to uh, observe that, that there may be some correlation to uh, issues that are, arise in the industrial arena, uh, not, not least of which um, some of the restrictive practices in terms of employment uh, and something that's been discussed in the safety, in the safety realm. Uh, but health and safety reps are really important. From a regulating perspective, uh, uh, um, the, your secretary has uh, advocated fiercely to uh, increase the amount of support that uh, WorkSafe provides to health and safety reps. Uh, so some simple things that uh, I'd like to uh, reinstitute. Um, I, I attended health and safety reps training. Uh, I don't know if anyone was there. But I, I've done that when I first started. Um, I think having a WorkSafe representative uh, talking to health and safety reps that, are, that when they do their first initial training is, uh, is a really important um, uh, uh, entry into uh, the health and safety rep world. Uh, having the ability to be able to communicate, for, for health and safety reps to communicate with WorkSafe uh, when they are dealing with some issues to get some um, specific advice. I, again, I think that that's a, a really important uh, step to uh, providing support uh, to health and safety reps. Uh, I might add that uh, under the legislation there is specific provisions for discriminatory behaviour. Uh, so again, the government has put in some really strong powers in the legislation uh, to protect uh, health and safety reps, uh, and not just elected health and safety reps, people that are uh, aiming to be health and safety reps. So they're really good provisions. Um, so uh, happy to uh, continue to advocate and support uh, health and safety reps. Obviously work with Unions WA uh, to find ways to do that. Um, there's no uh, simple measure that can be uh, adopted, but uh, there are some good ones that I'm keen to, to implement, so, so keen to do that. Um, just in terms of information, uh, I sort of suggested that from a work health and safety perspective, lots of discussion in the community, uh, probably more so than in any uh, uh, recent years. Uh, we have produced an enormous amount of information in conjunction with the Work Health and Safety Commission. So uh, recently we adopted uh, something in the order of around 25 uh, codes of practice that pick up uh, not just the National Safe Work Australia codes, but also uh, uh, amending our state codes of practice. So those codes provide practical guidance to, to industry uh, to understand how, meet, how to meet those obligations. Uh, the, the department has produced a whole lot of webinars, so we're in Safe Work Month. Uh, we've tried to cover off on a range of uh, topics, including silica, including psychosocial risks. So again, um, an enormous amount of material that is online for people to access the information. So I don't know that there's an exact formula for us to work to as a regulator with respect to providing information, but what I can say is that 
Uh, we do have an enormous amount uh, of information produced uh, from uh, an ag agency perspective, recognise uh, the importance of getting that out there um, and continuing to develop new guidance. Uh, but for now, we do have a lot out there and encourage you to have a look on the, on the website and uh, also the regulator uh, page uh, to avail uh, yourself of some of that um, information. I'll talk more on the panel. Thanks very much.